Um, I see that we are joined by Professor Yuri Leskovich, and um, we are waiting on the rest of our panelists. Um, hi, Yuri. How are you? Uh, hi, Erika. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's 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 late where you are, um, but we really appreciate um, having the opportunity to speak to so many of our company members. Yeah, I'm excited to join, um, and it's past uh, kids' bedtime, so uh, everything <laughs> is easier. It is not here. Our, our, I currently don't know where my kids are, so my husband's on the hunt. <laughs> um, uh, I think maybe we can start with kind of a broad question, uh, just so we make use of our time while we wait for uh, Professor Zhou and Professor Zaharia to join us. Um, what is your opinion of the current state of the art for big data and where do you think we're going next? Um, so <laughs> the way the way I would say is I think we are realizing uh, over and over again um, the importance of large amounts of data, both for analytics uh, and even more important. I think where things are uh, going next is that we are also realizing that collecting large scale data with uh, labels is uh, very, very expensive, either uh, in terms of uh, doing experiments, if we think about, let's say, natural sciences or using some kind of human annotation data collection um, and, and that's very expensive. So I think where where the kind of the the world is going to go and where the research is going to go, it will be about how do we learn from, let's say, many small data sets uh, in, and create a joint model, or perhaps uh, how do we design self-supervised type methods um, that, are, that are learning the structure of the data without the need uh, of expensive labels. And then how do we specialize these models on top with little small labeled data that we have. That sounds really great and ties into, I think a lot of the things that Andrew Ng was talking about. Um, apparently, I don't know if you guys can hear, but apparently it's garbage day here. So it may be a little noisy in my house. Um, hi, James and Matei, welcome to our panel. Uh, we just sort of got things started uh, with a question about where is the current state of the art for big data and where are we going next? Um, maybe to you, James. Hi, Erica, you're in Mate. Um, I, yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think one int really interesting trend in the data is that the data is becoming quite heterogeneous, right? Um, and it's also extremely expensive, right? So some of the data sets that, that we work with, that's uh, especially proprietary data, costs actually several billions of dollars to collect and to generate, right? So I think one of the big trends is uh, really thinking about um, what kinds of data is really the most useful to collect, to generate, right? And how do we even put prices and values to different types of data? I think that's really important both for people who are working with these kind of data, but also even for individual consumers who potentially might get compensated, or even for government regulators and the policy perspective. All right, so I think um, uh, really thinking about how the data works together and also the markets around data, I think that's really important. And actually, Matei uh, and Steve Iglash and I, we actually teach a class around data markets uh, that perhaps Matei may, may say a little bit more about. Matei, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, I guess everyone. Um, yeah, I, I think what James said is is uh, is uh, exactly right. So uh, one of the new things happening is people are figuring out um, kind of the economics uh, of data and also the the regulation around it. So there's very there's a lot of activity in this space. There's both uh, kind of um, um, externally. Uh, driven stuff like, you know, governments trying to figure out data protection regulations. Uh, and there's also just internal stuff inside each company or each organization. Uh, they're thinking hard about how to do data governance, how, how to manage that at scale and um, how to how to make sure that, um, you know, they can they can protect the data and they can, you know, they can they can reliably build things based on it. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I would say, I, I think um, just my view of it in, in terms of what I see, you know, in, in industry uh, as well is, uh, I think, you know, many organizations, 
pretty much most large organizations have now uh, realized what they can do with large data sets and they're, they're collecting them and they're doing things with them. But I think the processes for doing that are still very much in flux. So like, what's the best architecture? What's the tooling? You know, I, I work on computer systems and there's always new kind of programming models and interfaces uh, coming out to make it even easier to do this. Um, we have a, a question from one of our visiting scholars, Yuta Kurita, for uh, Professor Zo, but then we may kind of expand this to the rest of you. Um, he says, thanks for an inspiring talk. He's got a question regarding the data valuation part. Um, so do you need the whole or at least large portion of the data to quantify the data Shapley value? And in this setting, how can you use data Shapley for active learning or data market budgeting? Um, and then also, can you empirically estimate the data Shapley value with only a small amount of data, or do you need a large amount of data? Yeah, thanks for that great question. Um, so it turns out that we have some more recent works to show that even if you have very small amount of data, that's already sufficient to quantify and to estimate data Shapley values for perhaps like a much larger set of, you know, uh, of poorly labeled data sets, right? Um, and and I think the, the Shapley value is perhaps one approach where we can enable and do better active learning. That's something we're actually trying to uh, investigate further. So the standard approaches for active learning is oftentimes based on uncertainty, right? You want to collect more data where you're uncertain. I think valuation, like Shapley value, provides maybe a orthogonal or complementary approach to do active learning, where you want to collect data points where you're un both uncertain, but also you believe are likely to have high values. Right. And those could be because they are similar to the other data points you've seen before that are also, you know, have high values. Right. So I think that's potentially one approach where you can actually use techniques like data Shapley to do active learning. And also just to maybe to, to follow up a little bit on Matei, well, what Matei said is that, um, um, I mean, I think these regulations is uh, you know, absolutely really important. And I think we'll also come back to, to this later in the panel. Um, and I think they're also technically really challenging for big data companies, right? So actually many of the companies that, that uh, Matei and I, we worked with for as part of this class, I think the, the, the number one challenge that they said they all face is really how do they have to re-engineer their whole data pipeline to be compliant with policies like GDPR in Europe or the CCPA in California locally, right? So I think that's really one of the biggest challenges that many of the companies face right now. So to expand on this idea of, of small data, um, we've seen big data do a lot and, and make a lot of sort of revolutions in, across different industries. Um, have we sort of reached a point where the most big data can do is, is incremental um, improvements? Will the next major innovations come from methods developed for small data or from richer representations of data or, or new, more efficient ways of accessing and utilizing uh, big data? Uh, maybe to you, Yuri. Um, to me, this kind of uh, fascination it, it, with small data is a fascination and not much more. Um, I think we are taught kind of over and over again that um, bigger models, large, larger data, bigger compute lead lead to lead to advancement. And of course, our, our algorithms are also paving, paving the way. But in, in my talk, I showed some, some uh, slide, right, where it takes uh, three years from the data being available to get the breakthrough. And it takes about 18 years from the algorithm. What James and Matei have said is that is the is is in is in, as I said, kind of self-supervised. Um, this, I think, time of homogeneous large data sets is kind of over. So the tricks will, the trick will become, or the main question will become, how do we, how do we learn from a lot of small heterogeneous uh, data sets? Or relative, when I say small, I don't necessarily mean super small, but somehow not gigantic, homogeneous, clean, and you just plow through it. But try to learn a big model, a richer representation, which is where the, where the trend the, with a heterogeneous data set coming from many different, composed of perhaps even many different uh, modalities. And I think this is where kind of this graph relational representation 
they allow us they allow us to integrate uh, these different types of data and and learn over it simultaneously. Uh, Mate, any insights on on where I guess the differences in the you know whether or not the big data small data argument is valid or just a a, a new um, yeah, explanation I, I, of existing problems we've had all along. Yeah, I, I think there's still a lot to be figured out with, um, you know, with the large data sets that, that you can collect today. It's, it's, it's like straightforward to collect them, but then uh, there are many kinds of uh, operations that, you know, might be difficult to do on them. There are also issues around uh, data quality, for example, where if you could figure those out, you'd be able to do a lot more. So that's still where, where I think there's the most potential to do something new. Um, I think with the... Um, you know, the, the, the thing with kind of small data sets is that they're usually the result of summarizing something um, else, uh, unless you're really dealing with a small problem, right? Like if you're dealing, like, you know, maybe there are some, like say scientific problems where there are only like a few elements involved and you have to figure out something about them. So, okay, that's small, but, but anything else, you know, it's probably a summary of, uh, of stuff happening out there, like, uh, you know, people using a product or uh, whatever, you know, whatever it is, sensors out in the world or something like that. Um, but there are always insights that come from statistics that then people figure out how to productionize and apply at, at scale. So th there'll be, there will continue to be new ones. So we have another question from um, the audience from Ricky Ho. Can you elaborate a bit on how to create the synthetic data given you don't know the impact of the original data point on uh, to the model? So how do you figure out um, this new X, Y, uh, given you don't know how, how it affects the model? Um, I think this might be sort of directed towards, um, I'm just assuming uh, James's presentation on um, uh, removing private data, but I think it's a bigger question as well as we're generating synthetic data. Um, how do you deal with the, the assumptions you have to make with, with what, you know, while, while you don't even know what your original data is, is uh, supporting? James, do you want to comment a little bit on that? Yeah, happy to. Um, but first, I sort of want to say I really like what, what Yuri and Mateus said about the difference between big and small data. Uh, I mean, I absolutely agree with Yuri that these heterogeneous small data sets, that's extremely interesting and really important. And it's actually funny because I, so I do a lot of work in biology. So traditionally in biology, people think of heterogeneity as something that's really bad. Right? Like you want to correct away heterogeneity, you want to remove batch effects. But I think there's a recent, very recent shift in mentality right? that heterogeneity is actually our friend. Right? It's a feature, not a bug, in the sense that by looking at very heterogeneous data, then we can more likely to identify what are the features that are invariant across heterogeneous groups. And those are actually more likely to be the robust and causal relationships. Right, so that's just one example where by leveraging heterogeneity of many different small data sets, you can actually learn something that's more robust. Right? And the other example where I think this connection between big and small data is really interesting is actually where you have a large observational data sets. That's where a lot of the big data has come from. But you have very small amount of, let's say, randomized uh, data, perhaps from clinical trials or some more expensive, like true randomized A-B test. Right, so the randomized data is really expensive, right? Take, could take like 50K per patient to run a clinical trial. Then, then you have like this million sample size cohort for the observational data. Right, so that's also a really interesting area that we've been excited by is how do you combine the really big data from observations um, with the small data that come from randomization from potentially from clinical trials. Well, maybe we can explore that a little bit more and come back to the simulation question, because I would also love to hear um, from everyone on the panel about how you think about going from prediction to action. And I think of as, as data sets get larger and we start utilizing more um, observational data, that becomes a bigger issue about, you know, and it came up yesterday in some of our uh, questions um, from the audience about like, how do you go from observational data to action or how do you go from randomized control data to then the real world and this idea of you've built this great model, but is it going to perform realistically and how can we address that? I don't know who wants to, to jump in. I, guess I, I, can, I can start. So I think this is, this is actually um, very tough to do because um, 
any application that's based on data, like a machine learning application, but even something more simple, like you know, just reporting and showing people uh, stuff, uh, it needs to constantly be updated with new data. And if something goes wrong with that, it's going to give you some bad results. And if, if you know, for something for something like a machine learning model, things can also go wrong in uh, in fairly subtle ways. Like if you uh, you know, if you represent the data differently during training, and then when you apply the model, or if the distribution is uh, is different because of the way you collected the training data. Um, so I think this is a, a very important area. If you want machine learning to actually have an impact, it, it doesn't need to just you know give you a nice results once. Like when you take a machine learning course at a university and you build a model and it's like you know 90% accurate. It needs to be something where you trust that if you just let that thing run automatically every day, it's going to continue building our good results. So some of the, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of work on this. For example, in, in my research group, we have uh, some work on uh, basically uh, the equivalent of software assertions and software testing for machine learning models uh, to, to let you uh, detect issues and um, alert you when something's wrong or help you collect better data to fix them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work also on this kind of uh, what people call ML ops or ML platforms. So basically some software to monitor these applications uh, while they're running. So I think that's the thing you need to figure out is how, how can you get this to run on its own and to actually like make decisions that impact, you know, people in some way. Um, and just kind of to build on this, right, the, the problem becomes um, when, when you have these uh, closed loop systems where basically you are creating this self-fulfilling prophecies with machine learning, right? And um, you see this a lot in um, any kind of online environments or recommender systems and so on, where um, the problem becomes that basically the machine learning is selecting what data gets presented to the nature or to the user and, 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 what, uh, and what labels kind of do you obtain or what uh, signal do you obtain. Um, there are also domains where uh, kind of randomized data collection is impossible. Uh, we have uh, uh, with uh, the judicial system uh, uh, trying to trying to trying to help uh, 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 judges in courts uh, make better decisions. Right, judges in courts cannot randomize. Um, and and uh, if a computer would uh, replace them, then you would get this uh, feedback effect that you have to be um, very, uh, very careful about. But we have answers to these questions and there are ways to do proper machine learning um, in this kind of non-random uh, scenarios as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just also add, I think, certainly building these robust loops, that's extremely important. Right? It's also quite important to think about what are the right targets for the machine learning right, to, to really make it actionable uh, and deployable? Right? So for example, as, uh, we work on a lot of the biomedical healthcare problems. Right? So it's very tempting to say, let's build a machine learning model to predict disease X, right? or to suggest a particular treatment. Uh, and we've tried some of those, and those are actually quite hard to really deploy for a variety of reasons, both scientific and also even, even economic. Right? So sometimes it's actually not economically incentive compatible for, for the physicians to entirely rely, entirely rely on the machine learning predictions. Right, so then they have a lot of headwinds to actually uh, to have the model being actionable and be deployable. Uh, whereas if we actually change the target of prediction to rather be uh, predict a particular disease, but to do something more, uh, maybe you try to simplify uh, the operations of the clinicians, right? Maybe you stop short of the disease prediction, but you try to simplify their other uh, more manual uh, process to make those automated. Then they find that to be much more compatible with their existing workflows. And that actually made it much easier to deploy uh, and to have the impact on those machine learning systems. So it's, just, it's great to also think about so the bigger incentives for when do people actually want to use these machine learning algorithms. Yeah, to tie this back to the, the simulation question that we had about how do you simulate when you don't, or synthesize data when you don't really know the full model that you're trying to synthesize. Um, a question came up in uh, Andrew Ng's talk yesterday about, um, you know, is it 
appropriate or ethical to use GANs um, to generate more data in order to improve some sort of predictive model on, on clinical imaging. Um, so that's kind of a, an example where you are synthesizing data to improve your, your performance of your model, but you kind of have to wonder about whether or not that's um, ethical since you don't really know the, the model behind it or there's not this um, ability to interpret the model. So I don't know if we can kind of discuss synthetic data um, a little bit tying off of this going from observational data or randomized controlled data to the real world and, and what, where the gap is there and, and maybe where it's appropriate or not appropriate to use these models. I'm happy to start with a little bit uh, and then and the, uh, other people should feel free to jump in. So the I think there are some settings where because of privacy reasons, right, for example, where it's actually quite compelling to use synthetic data. Right? So there's a bunch of works recently, especially in genetics, right, where it's hard to release you know, genotype information of individuals. So there is quite compelling to uh, say if, we, if you can actually generate synthetic data right, that have the right properties, that captures the right correlations, but you can actually release those. Right? So that's actually quite, a, I think, a quite a useful impactful use case. Uh, and of course, I think a lot of recent research have shown various limitations and biases with all these generative models, right, including GANs and other generative models. And these are biases both from like, a technical perspective, right, maybe they have blind spots, but also potentially biases in terms of more like, societal perspective, which is what the, I think the question alluded to, right, because these models, the generative models, I think suffers from potentially some of the same data set biases that you find in discriminative or supervised models. Right, so that's sort of something that would be extremely important to, um, to keep track of, especially when people are actually using these synthetic data for deployment and for testing. Right? If they're not really representative and if they, they have their own biases, then you really want to be sure that whatever metrics you're testing it on, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's still robust when it's actually applied to, applied to the real population. Yeah, I would just echo that, that to me makes the most sense, like the motivation for these types of uh, approaches would be from the privacy uh, preserving uh, point of view, right? Like um, you can basically encode the signal, the variability of the signal in, uh, in again, and now people can kind of sample out from that complex distribution. That, that of course you, you use some training data to, uh, uh, to, uh, to learn the model from in, in any ways. Uh, so so um, uh, I think uh, the other place where perhaps uh, this kind of synthetic data sets might be useful is more for debugging models, uh, blind spot detection, if type questions, uh, where you can basically gen like generate um, samples and probe the response of the model across this uh, diversity, uh, diversity of samples. Uh, that I think is another uh, way of using it. Matei, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts or follow up on that. Yeah, not much more, I think. Yeah, I think this makes sense. All right, so um, I wanna take this uh, moment to encourage everyone to post questions in our Q&A box. Um, they can be technical questions about the presentation. They can be about applications, um, maybe to your particular industry. Maybe they're sort of more broad questions. Um, so while we wait on that, uh, we talked a little bit about you know, reinforcing biases um, as well as how to test these algorithms. Um, maybe it's a good time to talk about how can we develop machine learning that doesn't reinforce social biases and, and maybe whose responsibility is it to regulate the use of these models? Matei, I see you nodding. Maybe you can start us off uh, there. Sure, yeah. So I, I do think that, um, you know, this, is, this can be a tough problem and one way you really have to think about it in each domain. Um, you know, before you apply machine learning. So a, a lot of it is about how you set up the, the problem, you know, like if you set up, okay, I'm trying to predict, um, you know, something based on, um, uh, you know, like the person's location, uh, where they live, like their zip code, right? That maybe that seems okay, but then you realize that actually, uh, you know, that that can actually 
be highly correlated with like let's say a person's race or or something that you don't want to uh, you don't want the model to discriminate on. So that's that's an example of a problem. Another example is if you're trying to train a model and you're saying, okay, as the labels, we're going to use, you know, what we did historically for similar uh, people, right? Like let's say similar job applicants or something. Then you're just reinforcing the biases that might have existed in those ex in those past ones. So you do have to think about how you'll frame the problem and what inputs you'll put in, uh, what metrics you'll try to have come out of it. Um, and interestingly, people have a lot of experience thinking about this in other business contexts. Like for example, if you're trying to detect fraud or, or uh, something like that, you know, it's a, it's a very adversarial environment. So you think pretty hard about, you know, what can someone do to bypass your model and what are you actually aiming to prioritize? Uh, same thing, you know, if you're doing some like financial trading or something, and you know that if the model is wrong, you're going to lose um, a lot of money. So, so people do have experience thinking about s some issues like this, but um, uh, you know, it's it it's quite possible that they skip applying it in in the cases where they should. Um, so I think that's a very high level answer. In terms of who regulates it, uh, you know, you do get pretty far with regulators. Like there are already, uh, for example, regulations about things like how you, you know, how people can decide, uh, you know, whether to give you a loan and stuff like that. And organizations take them seriously because it's a very, you know, it's very expensive to them if they don't do it. But there aren't regulations about many of the other uh, places where people are using AI. and. Uh, I think, you know, it'll take some work to figure out how to even categorize those and which ones are the most important to think about. Any follow up uh, from, from Yuri or James on um, social biases and reinforcing these and um, as well as how and who should regulate? Uh, so we've been, we have a a paper coming out uh, in uh, in nature medicine looking at this on in the case of medical diagnostics and uh, <laughs> what we find is that if you properly develop train models then they are le less biased than the humans themselves um, and perhaps the the uh, the main take take point take take away point is that it is important what you train what you train the the biological or the artificial neural network with um, and uh, when we look at the, at the data um, we find out that human neural networks meaning doctors education uh, many times is uh, basically doctors are trained on in in many cases we were looking at uh, osteoarthritis so pain in the knee um, on the uh, on non-diverse uh, data sets um, and uh, uh, we find out that basically if you only train, let's say, on, on, on people coming from uh, uh, niece coming from white people, you, will, uh, you won't be able to read properly uh, the MRIs of uh, uh, people from other races and so on, or other socioeconomic cultural uh, backgrounds, uh, racial backgrounds. So I, I think uh, training data is uh, amazingly important. Um, and then I think it's also very important to to kind of vet vet the model, dis discover bl blind spots before we are kind of putting this in, in into um, in, into production. And I think, as as Matei was saying, it is also very important, like, to decide what is the proper target um, of the of the of the prediction, because that will have also a lot of the impact on. Um, how how biased uh, these models these uh, these models are and of course what got a lot of publicity recently was especially like kind of the failure cases in terms of hiring uh, search, uh, web search and so on yes yeah, so just to add a, on top of the the great comments from Yuri and Matea um, which I, I think are, are really terrific um, so I think the other part that would be really useful is to have some frameworks to really audit and to measure accountability right, for AI systems. Right? So like if, if you're driving your car and your car breaks down, you know, there's a set of steps you can do right, in the garage to figure out, is it because the engine broke? Is it because you have a flat tire or if you, forgot, you forgot to change the oil? Right? So what, what actually happens? And that's actually something where it would be really great to have for more general AI systems 
Right. Um, and as you already mentioned, the failure modes of these AI systems could be because maybe some particular components of your AI system, maybe some subroutines uh, have certain biases or has, didn't consider certain types of constraints in the data. It could be also be because of the certain subset of your training data itself, right, could have uh, problems which uh, maybe they're mislabeled or maybe they're not representative. Um, so you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to think about if you take all of that whole ecosystem together, right, both the training data generation process as well as the training of the algorithm itself, right, how do we really assign responsibility in terms, in cases of failure, assign responsibility quantitatively to each individual component of that entire pipeline. Right? Um, so I think that's still early stage work, but I think something like that could make it more systematic to think about uh, transparency and traceability of these AI systems. So I did see we had a follow-up question or a clarification about the, the synthetic data um, that's in our chat box um, that asks about how to create the negative synthetic data to neutralize the effect of the original data to achieve the removal um, from, from James, James's work, given you don't know the effect of the original data in the model. Um, do you know the effect of the original data of the model, or is this something where you're doing some sort of approximation, or you know, how, do you, how do you know that, I guess, that you've, you've effectively neutralized it if you don't know um, the impact that the data point has on the model? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question, and it's quite challenging to do in general. Right? So the idea of the synthetic data in that case uh, is that, you know, let's say if I want to remove your personal data, right? if I want to delete your data, I want to basically create a synthetic individual who will have many of the similar features as you do, but with perhaps a different outcome, right? a different label, so that if I train your model on the synthetic individual, that would have the same effect as to neutralize your data. Right? And the way that we try to do it as a first step is to basically we use the same set of features, but we have to modify the label. Right? So the synthetic data would have the same features as the original data point that we're trying to delete, but the labels would be different, right? So we have to carefully create the labels in a way that we think would counterbalance the effect of the original data point. Um, we can do this in a way that's guaranteed to be correct for, I, I would say, for a certain class of models, or for a certain class of regression models, we know this is correct. But in general, this is still an approximation, right? So we don't know we, if we have completely removed the effect of the original data point, like you've mentioned. We have some bounds on how much we have removed, but we don't know if we removed it exactly. So that's still an open area for research. Another plug for, for big data so that the uh, impact is, is harder to find. Um, I think maybe now would be a good time to talk a little bit about privacy and security. Um, you know, James, you presented some of your work on, on people electing to have their, their data removed. Um, and Matei, I know that you do some work uh, both on you know, secure private querying, as well as um, some work on developing systems that are scaled up and maybe have a potential to do more um, secure computing on the edge. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how privacy and security fits into each of your research programs and um, where you think the bigger impacts or the big successes will be going forward. Okay. You can start, Matei. Okay, yeah. So uh, yeah, there are a couple of interesting aspects here. So, so one thing that I've been working on and a lot of other people are, have been as well is if you take some of the most kind of, you know, critical um, computer applications for, for people today where they really want privacy, what does it take to provide very strong guarantees? So for example, take something like messaging, right? Like I want to be able to, to text my friend or whatever without, like random organizations looking at it, um, or take something like uh, web search, right? I, I, I want to look up information, but now just based on the queries that I make, uh, all kinds of people are figuring out, you know, all kinds of information about me, and, and I don't want that to happen. Um, and so, so the, the angle that I've taken on this is, and which is kind of interesting and goes against the the whole, uh, you know, big data line of work is that um, actually for, you know, this kind of really important like human generated data is very small. So if you think of like messages, for example, you know, each person, uh, you know, sends maybe like say 10 or 100, you know, messages per day. Um, it's a tiny amount of data overall, like you can get a server on Amazon with, you know, that, that costs like, you know, let's say like 
five or six dollars an hour and get, can store all those messages in memory and that can do a scan over them in a few seconds and so on. Uh, so we've actually been developing algorithms that you know use parallel hardware and take this small data and give you very strong guarantees over it. Uh, for example, uh, you know where I can exchange messages with someone and no one can tell uh, uh, you know uh, which you know which person I'm talking with. Um, so so. That, that's an interesting angle and the cost to do this is actually very small so in terms of dollars so it, it turns out for these highly critical applications you can throw in more advanced um, uh, you know cryptography or differential privacy or other tools and you can actually support them so I think the next step for this is to, to make sure that these are easily deployable but and but you can already see you know for example with uh, companies like signal there is some uh, consumer interest in these things and uh, you know both for like um, messaging and for search uh, and and these kind of lookup applications like looking up directions on a map uh, we figured out pretty scalable ways to do them at low cost like a few cents per day uh, per person who's using the system. Um, so I think that's an exciting area. Yeah, that's more like science fiction, you know, research stuff, like what would it look like if, if we could provide this. Um, then on the more like practical side of what people are doing, I do think this is why I was saying that the systems people work with, you know, like databases, whatever, uh, you know, data lakes, file systems, all these things uh, are being modified to make it easier to, to implement rich uh, security policies. So there's a lot of interesting um, innovation there to make it very easy to specify these policies, audit what happened. And I think this is an important area as well. If you don't do this, then, uh, you know, either you have things blow up and create problems or you just have, uh, you know, less use of these data sets and, and less of the less, you know, of their potential can be realized because organizations are afraid about opening them up to, uh, to more internal use cases. Um, so that's something that I see just happening in the design of these uh, systems. Um, yeah, the, the, these are kind of the two big trends I see, a more research oriented trend and also more practical trend of like people rethinking how, how to centrally manage the you know, security properties of maybe like thousands of data sources you have in one company. Right, and, and a related trend I've seen is really I think it requires for rethinking of what does it actually mean for privacy and for security for this kind of modern data, right? So just to give a concrete example, like this, you know, people have talked a lot about the right to be forgotten, right? Which is both in CCPA and in GDPR in the EU. Right? If you think about right to be forgotten, it's actually quite different from traditional standard notions of privacy, because it means that you know, an individual can give access to their data to Facebook, to Google, but then maybe at a later time point, right? whenever they want to, they can actually decide to cut off access, right? And it's not enough just to cut off access. They also have to, the companies have to actually delete this data, right? So that notion of right to be forgotten from a privacy perspective is actually counter privacy, right? Because just by looking at how the model has changed before and after you deleted the data, that actually leaks a lot of privacy about this individual. But, at, but it's also, I think it's quite important because maybe individuals have many reasons, perhaps political or moral reasons where they want to delete their data outside of privacy considerations, right? So that's why I think there's a lot of requirements now that have been people are thinking about that really goes beyond traditional notions of privacy and security. And I think those are really challenges both for ML systems and also for algorithms designers, right? Another example of this is this data portability, right? Which is also being discussed, right? So now, you can actually say, I want to port all of my data from, you know, from Amazon to somewhere else, right? How do you actually make that work? And, uh, and would that actually encourage uh, the more democratizations of, of, or more competition over data sets? So I think those are some really important uh, and open questions. So we have a question in the Q&A box that, um, from from Ricky Ho, and again, I encourage all of you attending to post questions. Um, how do you detect or prevent malicious organization injecting wrong data trying to misguide the model? Um, is there a way to isolate the bogus data to make the model more robust to that, to minimize the adverse effect um, to the model? 
Uh, Yuri, maybe you can talk a little bit about this because I know that you um, you started some newer co collaborations around anomaly detection. Um, you know, maybe there's uh, an opportunity for doing adversarial um, machine learning uh, using uh, you know the particular graph representation. <laughs> Yeah, we. Um, I think I think that is uh, uh, that is a good question, and uh, we've been um, uh, doing this in terms of perhaps not necessarily uh, data generation, but at the level of detecting a kind of a malicious entity inside an organization or a set of uh, a set of malicious entities. And what we have uh, found out is that this. Uh, 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 signatures of uh, of interactions of this entity with with other entities kind of reveal uh, often tends to reveal um, its its true nature. So um, methods like uh, anomaly detection, perhaps even um, adversarial learning uh, type methods, uh, would be appropriate to try to um, define detect the um, the trustworthiness of each uh, of each data point. Um, this also reminds uh, a lot of uh, uh, it. It depends also kind of on the structure of the data itself, but it reminds a lot on this kind of uh, games uh, can, uh, uh, use cases where you have uh, spammers uh, uh, trying to manipulate the underlying structure, let's say, of the web graph in order to do search engine optimization and and the methods that you have. Uh, to try to identify this type of fabricated parts of, let's say, the web graph, or in this case, the data. And essentially, um, you have uh, you have uh, an, an approach where you could be saying, um, if you have a trusted set of data, um, then then you can create, let's say, a small uh, proxy model, and you could then evaluate the value or discrepancy for every for every uh, data point in prediction of 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 um, of uh, the trusted model versus the full data model and based on these types of comparisons you could try to identify what are the what are the critical data points um, that perhaps are changing the predictions and and evaluated their provenance yeah and i think here's also also example where having more fully accountable systems, AI systems that's traceable, I think it's also could be quite useful, right? So if you can actually figure out, oh, your system's making mistakes because of these particular subset of data, right? Uh, not because of any issues with the actual algorithm, right? So if you have that accountability framework, then I think that would also make it easier to both detect and to actually trace and to correct for these potential data attacks or data poisoning type issues. So we have kind of a follow-up point, but what if that critical point that what was identified as an anomalous data point um, is actually valid? Uh, you know, I think this ties into some of the questions and discussion we had about biases and, and these sorts of things is, you know, are, are we risking, how sensitive does our, do our models need to be? And, and do we risk, you know, making the distribution smaller by, you know, erroneously removing these, these valid points? So I can add something. We 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 are just um, uh, conducting uh, research uh, around um, the problem where you say how much noise would I tolerate? This is not in adversarial setting, but see, like how much noise would I tolerate in my in my data uh, uh, and still being able to uh, correctly correctly learn the classifier? So in some sense, you could imagine I have a set of the correctly labeled data points and I have a set of let's say noise in I, I will say no, uh, the word noisy but you could imagine kind of corrupted data points and and it turns out that the right way to look at this is um, as you are training the model is to look at the uh, to look at these data points not in the original feature space but to look at them in the gradient space and and based on the gradients of these data points you can actually detect figure out which ones are which ones are noisy and which ones are uh, uh, correctly labeled so you can still learn correct uh, classifiers uh, even if you have um, a lot of uh, missing uh, or uh, mislabeled data
Yeah, I'll also add that I think part of this is also how much you let each individual data point uh, influence things. So um, it's again, it's a bit in the design of your method, right? But if, if each person, you know, say each user of the system can only have a small influence on the model and also it's it's hard to sign up like fake users then you know you're in a good spot uh, but if it's uh, easy for one user to have you know to have a huge influence uh, you know by providing some extreme values or if it's easy to sign up you know fake ones or whatever then uh, then you have a problem and I think you need that oh, sorry, go ahead, James. sorry uh, that influence something I mentioned is basically the, you know, the other side of the privacy coin, right? So a lot of the techniques that people develop, like differential privacy to protect privacy, right, is basically uh, mathematically trying to limit the influence of any individual data points can have on the whole system. Right? So basically as a byproduct of trying to make your models more private, uh, you know, or privacy aware, you're also basically making your models more robust to the potentially bogus data uh, or outlier attacks. And I'd imagine there's not a, you know, one size fits all solution. Um, I, I would, we talk about this a lot um, at Stanford about, you know, how do you, you know, monitor these models and how do you audit them? And, and it's, it's not, I don't think that there's one setting that works for everything, but that you'll have multiple parameters that you, you fix for your, you know, acceptable risk, um, you know, uh, concern with adversaries, noise, that sort of thing. So um, it definitely would be interesting to hear um, some of those challenges that we see from, because I know we have a lot of different industries in the audience. Um, we have another question about uh, privacy um, relating to, you know, once you make somebody's data available or involve it in a model, how do you then make things more secure? Um, is it true that there's no way to tighten the security once you've loosened it, loosened it um, at least not for the past data? Um, that's probably a big question. I know this idea of removing um, individuals from your data set. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that or, or ways to, to sort of retrospectively fix the privacy issues in, in data that's already been released or used, aside from trusting companies to, to remove the data. I think it's a challenging question, and I would say probably the the best solutions right now are uh, really around more legal policy solutions rather than technical solutions, right? Um, I think you know there's certainly legal agreements that says, for example, if I purchase a data set from you, I'm not allowed to post that data set online or just share it with all of my friends, right? So I think that's at least in the short term, that's probably still the 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 way to think about how can we craft a reasonable set of legal regulations around this to, uh, uh, to, you know, to make sure that the data is not being shared uh, and to protect the, the usage rights. I think technically, I mean, there's some works on trying to watermark data sets and similar to how people watermark images, but I think that's still quite difficult to do, right, for, you know, for a lot of tabular data, for other kinds of data. And um, so I think right now it seems like this legal regulations and legal agreements are still uh, quite effective. Yeah, I'd also say that in practice, I, th I think what often happens is, um, you know, organizations try to put a time limit on how long they keep the raw data and to track that as it passes through different systems. So, um, so for example, with something like GDPR, one of the requirements is that, um, you know, if someone tells you to delete their data, you have to do it within 30 days. Um, so how are you going to do that? So a very difficult way is you go through in each of your systems and you search in them and you say, okay, this is this user's data. This is a model derived from them. And like, let's delete it. A uh, much easier way is to say, we'll delete all data after, you know, like every 30 days. Um, and, uh, you know, and we'll just like build things or we'll only keep aggregate results that we know are okay to keep. Uh, according to, to GDPR. So, um, so many people opt for that easier way. So I think it's more, it's viewing it as, uh, you know, almost like as a toxic, you know, byproduct or whatever, the, 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 the raw data and trying to, to manage it and get rid of it, uh, basically. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A box from Koresh Motoresi. 
What types of models have worked better for malware detection in your experience? Will graph neural networks approaches be more advantageous than deep neural network models? Um, why? Uh, uh, this is, I, I think, a very, um, I think it's a very good question. Uh, it all depends on um, the, the domain in which you are uh, applying these things. So I think the question is about uh, malware, so uh, 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 software. Um, I think in this, it, 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 I think it kind of really at the end all depends how are you representing your data, right? If, if the anomaly can be detected by uh, nature of relationships of the entity of the object with other, with other objects, which is for example, the case if you think about uh, doing fraud detection um, um, and any kind of coordinated activity on, let's say, um, a platform like Amazon, then the network information will be crucial for you to identify things. Uh, if you are talking about malware as a, I know, as a, as a, as a piece of code, um, I would imagine, uh, and you have no other information, then you know, uh, a deep network is is the way to go. If you now are able to look inside the the software to identify the 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 function calls and so on, there might be a good graph-based representation that will um, allow you um, allow you to do this. So basically, I think the point is whenever whenever you are doing um, anom anomaly detection or whenever you are trying to detect um, uh, uh, fr uh, fraud and so on, the, the, question, the question is what data modality is kind of uh, the hardest to, hi to, hide, to hide yourself in, right? And, um, you know, um, if you look at um, spam or anything like that, it's very easy to hide content, but there are behavioral attributes that are much harder to mimic or, or hide, and those are kind of then is, allow you to detect what is, what is good and what is bad. Um, Yuri, we have a follow-up question for you. Uh, it says, thanks for the great talk. Um, for imbalanced classification problems like online fraud detection, do you still have the same logic of tolerating the noise and still get a correct classifier? How do you weigh separately the noise toleration for the minority class from the majority class? Oh, that's a that's a that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent question and and something that uh, uh, when you develop these solutions, you have to be uh, very um, uh, careful, uh, very careful about, especially in, let's say, um, uh, 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 fraud detection, spam, uh, and so on, where where the, the where you very you also your your labels are are uh, noisy, and only a couple of let's say data points uh, cases or a small number of them get investigated, get labeled, and so on. So I think um, what is very important is to understand both the let's say the resolution or the data labeling process and um, and and um, I think that's the first important part because there might be a lot of biases in in that and then the second the second important uh, part is to be to be careful and mindful of the noise as well as the 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 imbalance uh, between the classes how can you uh, how can you deal with this you deal with this as in any kind of um, extreme uh, classification scenario. So either by reweighting, by having different uh, different um, a loss function that kind of takes uh, takes errors or mistakes on different classes uh, separately, and then even at the end, I think it's very important to make sure that kind of your predictions are well uh, kind of are well uh, calibrated. That's another uh, another step that is important. James, I don't know if you want to jump in and follow up a little bit. I mean, uh, this is a huge issue in, in health as well, um, where you're looking at, at rare events. Um, any techniques or, or suggestions to, to help people with those sorts of um, questions? Yeah, so it, it is a really uh, challenging problem uh, for these rare events. And I think here, there's also a variety of different loss functions. Right, and I think some of them might be more robust and uh, for these problems, right? Um, certainly using the standard kind of loss functions, we're optimizing for those objectives, right? That's oftentimes sort of aggregates over the entire population. Those tends to be uh, oftentimes not so good for these rare events, uh, just because, or for these very uh, imbalanced settings, because just because they're sort of underrepresented in the overall population level loss. 
right? So we have been investigating some alternatives that we're calling like the, the close K loss functions, right? Which are, um, which is a, sort of a, a different set of family of loss functions that basically allows one to prioritize um, these rare events, right? Um, so depends on the application. So we'll try that in a variety of some healthcare applications and those seems to be uh, potentially quite well suited for the kinds of noise and imbalance that we see in the healthcare settings. Um, so what about explainability and interpretability techniques? Um, are there good ones that exist for uh, graph neural networks? I know that's sort of an area of um, new research for, for some of you. I don't know who wants to, to jump in. And <laughs> yeah, I, I don't personally know anything specific to graph neural networks, but it seems that with the graph structure, you might be able to do something, uh, something special. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe that's for a question for next year. Um, I know yeah. that there's been some work on just, you know, explainability and interpretability on, on neural question. networks, but yeah. yeah, expanding that, you know, that's, that's pretty innovative stuff just in, you know, standard neural networks, but looking at how to transfer that to the graph would be um, definitely yeah. an exciting we, area of research. We have, we have some, um, some work in that, in that domain. Um, what is interesting, I think, about uh, graphs is that it's both the structure that is important as well as properties, uh, labels, types uh, of nodes. So when you generate an explanation, you kind of need both the structural explanation as well as the, the properties, features of nodes. And you have to kind of identify uh, both of them um, at, the, at, the same, at the same time. At least that was kind of... Uh, uh, our approach, but it's even a good, I think, kind of open question. What does the explanation in a, in a relational data even mean? Is it this, is it a subgraph? Is it some other? Is it some other summary um, that that would explain why something was, uh, let's say, classified in a given way? Uh, but if you think about molecule, like we were mostly working with. Um, um, On, uh, then of course a sub part of the molecule is your explanation. You say, oh, because of the benzene ring, the molecule will have this type of property. So if you detect it, you gave a good um, explanation. Um, this will be the the last question from the audience, and then I'll ask you guys to sum up with where you, your research is going next. Um, but from the audience, we see. Uh, it's another question about graph neural networks. Um, how do you actually create the, the graphs? Are they um, captured from physical relationships or domain knowledge or, you know, perhaps some other method from, you know, probabilistic graphical models where you're, you're using a method to build these, these sorts of uh, graphs? Oh, uh, that's, a good, that's a great question, right? So for example, in my talk, when we were doing physics uh, simulations, there you basically create graphs based on objects that are cl physically close to each other. And you say, oh, if you are close, kind of, there must be forces, there must be interaction. So I will create the, the connections and then learn across those, those connections. So sometimes you can create networks based on the, based on the proximity. Most of the times, uh, these networks are given are a natural way to represent your data. If you think about relationships in a knowledge graph, if you think relationships in a in a social network, uh, and uh, if you think about relationships between atoms in the in the molecule, if you think about even representing source code, computer code, it's all about re about relationships between uh, functions and the operations between them. So basically, I think the point is that a lot of um, in a lot of domains, the natural representation of the underlying domain is this uh, graph-based uh, rep representation. In, in other cases, you can kind of learn this representation uh, from raw data um, uh, as, as you go. For example, you can think even about uh, graph representation of time series and so on, where you basically learn that representation as you are uh, as you are learning, and that graphical representation repre kind of provides you a, a nice succinct, succinct way to way to uh, summarize the data. All right. Well, maybe we'll go in reverse order from from where we went at the beginning and talk a little bit about where your research is going next. Matei, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. So. 
Um, I, I continue to be uh, excited about these, uh, you know, uh, these issues of productionizing machine learning. Uh, so topics like model assertions and similar ways to monitor these models. Uh, we're also doing quite a bit of work uh, in my group on, on just selecting the data that you want to train on uh, for different objectives, including for uh, fairness uh, also. Um, so I think these are these are really important if you if you want uh, this stuff to become applications and to actually run reliably and be used for uh, for high stakes kind of uh, decisions. Uh, so I, I think th this is probably the area that I'm uh, most interested in these days. Uh, but you know, there's a lot else uh, going on, and uh, the nice thing is that you know, once you work in these areas, you can you, you can tackle a few of these problems and see how they connect to each other. Yeah. James, what's next for your group? Yeah, so I think some of these questions that we've discussed around the economics and policies and regulations and fairness around AI systems, right? I think those are going to be increasingly important critical questions for our entire community and for the entire ecosystem, right? And I think those are also really challenging questions, both from a, you know, a modeling perspective, right? How do we even define these properties since we're going beyond standard notions of privacy and security, and also from an algorithmic perspective, right? And these still a lot of really challenging and interesting new algorithms. So I think that's going to be a kind of big area that we'll continue to explore, right? Um, and and also along those lines, uh, Matei and I, we have some recent works also around how do we um, just be more economically efficient, right? When we're using different machine learning APIs that are becoming more and more uh, widely available now. Um, another area I think is gonna be that we're super excited about going forward is really thinking about data across very different modalities, right? So now, for example, we have the, you know, time series data of medical records, for example, of patients. On top of those medical records, we also have at different time points, like very rich imaging data, right? Which could be from ultrasound, from pathology images. We also have text, right? So those are very different modalities. Now you have to develop new techniques, both across computer vision, across time series, across NLP, to think about how do we learn joint representations of these very different types of data. And again, it also has the challenges of being observational data, right? So that also leads to these causal inference questions. Right, so I think that data integration um, of large scale observational data, maybe with a small hint of randomization, seems uh, would be a really important problem. And we're super excited about that going forward. And Yuri, how about your group? Um, yeah, so um, a couple of things, right? Like we are right now um, excited about uh, how do you learn both from labeled and unlabeled data, so kind of uh, few shot, zero shot type applications, especially in um, natural sciences where, where obtaining label data is very expensive, but you have a lot of kind of surrogate similar data sets and how do you learn uh, all this uh, well. Um, uh, and then both in terms of um, robustness where there is also uh, label noise. Um, so this is, I think, one line of work. Um, another line of work goes a lot uh, into uh, knowledge graphs and how do we capture heterogeneous prior knowledge and then be able to reason over it, um, in particular for question answering, common sense reasoning, um, things like that. Um, those are those are kind of the two uh, big directions uh, for the for the group. All right, well, I want to thank our panelists um, for you know their talks earlier as well as joining us for this this discussion, and I want to thank. Um, the industry folks who posted questions, they were really, really great. And um, I certainly enjoyed the past hour and three minutes of, of discussing.